Good morning and welcome to this which is the first in a series of webinars that will be dealing with the building regulations, the guidance contained in the approved documents on how to comply and some of the processes involved in making submissions and checking designs for compliance with those building regulations. Today we're going to be looking at part P and part Q of the regulations and Going forward, we will be asking you at the end of this webinar to give us an indication of the next subject area that you would like covered in a couple of months time. The format for today is very slightly different in that we will be asking you to um, ask questions in the normal way by typing into the panel, but we will be addressing all of those questions at the end rather than trying to pick some as we go through. And that's just for logistical reasons at our end today. So please ask questions, pop them in, and then as we get to the end, we will try and cover off all of the issues that you have raised. So let's start looking at part P of the building regulations, which deal with electrical safety. Now, part P in terms of electrical safety only applies to domestic dwellings. The consideration is that in the commercial sector, the majority of clients require installations to be installed and tested and we'll be looking for electrical test certificates um, as part of their overall obligations not least of which being their obligation in terms of um, safety and fire prevention so part p is restricted to looking at domestic dwellings and it covers the design the installation and the testing of those installations to ensure that we have a safe situation and what we're trying to make sure is that in using the electrical installation, people within the property aren't likely to suffer electrical shock. And at the same time, the installation itself isn't going to cause a fire within the property. So how do we go about doing that? Well, first of all, we have to look at the scope of the building regulations and what they apply to, because they don't cover everything within the domestic dwelling. Um, they only cover the particular risk situations. Now, the first technical bit of this is that uh, the definition is that the requirements only apply to low or extra low voltage installations. Now, without getting into the technical electrical end of things, what we really are saying is this is the sort of installation we are going to come across within a domestic property. And then we're looking at something that is in connection with that dwelling. That might be the installation in the dwelling itself. It might be something that is fed from a supply in the dwelling that is outside the property, maybe in an outbuilding or within the, the landscape attached to the property. Um, so it may well be connected there. The scope of this is such that it will deal with the common parts of a building that serve one or more dwellings. So it will look at things like the common parts of a block of flats, um, but it won't deal with installations within those areas of major electrical equipment, things such as lifts. It is limited again in terms of the, the scope by the overall requirements of what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so what we're looking at then, as I say, will all include anything that gets its electrical source from the dwelling itself. And that could be something on land or in a garden associated with the property or something that's shared with the dwelling and then we would be looking to test that as well and obviously anything in those sort of environments are the sort of situations where potentially there's going to be a higher level of risk to the end user which is obviously what we're trying to um, determine and trying to make sure that we don't endanger people within the property so as i've said um, part p does apply to the land associated with the building. So potentially external lighting, um, pumps and the like, as well as supplies to things like sheds, garages, greenhouses, are all technically covered under the general scope of Part P of the building regulations. Now, although electrical work is covered under Part P, not all electrical work needs notification to a building control body um, and a great deal of what we do in terms of electrics can be carried out without going for, through a formal process. Electrical work is slightly different than the approach we take in some other circumstances. Uh, the approach we take to things like gas safety restricts severely who can carry out work on 
gas installations. They have to be on the gas safe register. Um, and you can't ordinarily go along to a DIY superstore and buy an awful lot of fittings to play with the gas on a do-it-yourself basis. It's completely different in the electrical sector. Um, there is no restriction on individuals carrying out the work themselves. And indeed, it is possible to go along to most of the superstores and buy everything you need to completely wire a domestic property. And therefore, we've developed a regime of looking at how do we differentiate between those installations that are done by competent electricians and those that may be done by um, uh, DIY uh, builders or maybe even small builders where electrics is not part of their day-to-day -day routine. So a regime has, has developed around Part P about who can do what and how we certify. From the point of view of the guidance in the approved document, it's determined that we can assume that uh, building regulation compliance has been achieved if the principles of BS 7671 have been adopted. And this deals with not only the final installation and whether it's safe to use, but also the design, um, the protection to cabling, the routing of cabling, and so a lot of the installation issues. So when looking at the installation for safety with Part P, it's not simply can we plug something in and does it work and are we going to get electrical shock it is about the sizing of cabling it's about the positions of cabling so that later on when we come to retrofit something in the building we have a good idea of where the cables are actually going to run or where they should be running and we can do so in a fairly safe manner but what we're normally looking at then is somebody who's done an element of design albeit it may be the contractor doing it from experience in the head rather than actual paper design um, a subsequent installation and then the, the system being tested to sign off to say yes it meets the standard and once we've got some sort of confirmation that it's met a standard then we're reasonably happy to say that it would be safe in use. Now depending on how the work is done it's not always necessary for notification to be given to building control before the work is carried out. Um, if work is undertaken by somebody who is considered to be competent and registered under a self-certification scheme, they can carry out the works and the notification will be received by the building control body, usually in this instance the local authority, um, sometime after the work has been carried out. So an awful lot of work will be done within this category where a competent certified electrician has done the design, the installation and the testing will certify that through an accreditation scheme and therefore a formal building regulation application doesn't actually become part of the process. The other side of the coin, the other work that can be carried on without necessarily having to have an application submitted is that work that is still covered and still needs to be safe but is not notifiable. Um, so electrical work that isn't notifiable where we haven't got a new circuit being installed doesn't need notification and that does mean then that people can still change the odd fitting without having to go through an application process so changing the, the light switch, the socket, um, the ceiling rows, that sort of thing without having to go through an application process. However, some work does need notification um, and that work is basically wherever installing a brand new circuit if we're replacing a consumer unit, those are obviously key risk areas and fairly major works, but also any work that involves alteration to a circuit in a special location. And special locations are defined within the approved documents as generally those where there's a higher level of risk um, to the end occupier, or if the installation isn't installed correctly, there are major potential consequences. So quite, quite obviously this would be somewhere where there's a danger of um, water kicking around and higher risks of electrical shock. So rooms within a bar that's got a bath or a shower, um, we create a zone of space around that bath and shower, 2.25 metres high, 6 metres wide from the water source and the bath or the shower so that actually anything within that area requires an application. And similar provisions apply to things like swimming pools, saunas and the like. So there are 
in essence, three options in terms of how we go about demonstrating compliance or, or the process we can take through the building control system. Um, but the first stage with any of these is to determine whether or not the work requires an application. So is it notifiable? If it's not notifiable, then yes, we can carry on with the work. We still have to make sure it's a safe installation. If it is notifiable, then the, the primary route for demonstrating compliance is to get the installation installed by a competent person. Now, competent person schemes under the building regulations exist for elements of the work where an individual or an organization does the design, the installation, and the testing of that element of the work, and therefore is in a position to be able to sign off uh, the work as complying with the building regulations and complying in all respects with the building regulations. So the competent person schemes in terms of electrical installation do exactly that. The um, person wishing to have the work carried out engages a competent person. They do the design, the installation, and the testing. Once they've completed that process, they send details of the work to a scheme operator. They have to be signed up to an accreditation scheme, which assesses their competence and maintains records in terms of the level of their work and also deals with any issues that may arise in terms of um, problems with any of the work that's been undertaken. At the same time, the person carrying out the work will give a certificate to the owner and occupier of the building. And then building control become aware of this some 30 days later or up to 30 days later when the scheme operators send through a notification. Now this works perfectly adequately where the electrical work is the only work that's being carried out. If the work's being carried out as part of another project, this delay of 30 days can actually cause difficulty when trying to issue completion or final certificates under building regulations. And in these instances, it may well be the case that the building control um, service will look to gain a copy of the owner's certificate to demonstrate that the work complies ahead of the notification coming through from the competent person scheme. At the other extreme, we have the situation where the work is carried out by somebody who's not defined as a competent person. Could be the small jobbing builder, it could be the DIY person. Um, they would have to submit an application to building control before doing the work and at that point the building control body would then determine what level of inspection is appropriate, what level of testing may be appropriate for the, for the job. Um, the difficulty there is obviously if nobody's doing the design, the installation has to be looked at to make sure the cabling is the correct size in the correct position. Um, a lot of maybe some calculations would have to be done and then somebody would have to be signing the job off at the end, which normally would involve a test. It's not necessarily a very practical route. And as a result, a, a third option has been introduced, which is for somebody who's not competent to carry out the work and to get a third party to certify it based on an installation condition report. Now they will only be able to, obviously at the end of the job, if that's when their involvement begins, look at the completed installation and carry out some testing. They won't be able to look behind the scenes to see the cables running in the correct location, that it's supported correctly, that it's protected from impact, and that it's correctly sized. So it is a little bit more limited, but again, a scheme is developing for these third party certifiers where we can then deal with registration and notification in the same way. And some of the people offering this service may be the same as the competent people, some of them may not. But at the end of the job, one way or another, we have to have the ability to be sure that the system is safe to use before the project is signed off under building control. When we get to the end of the job and we're looking at, at compliance, Part of the requirement now is to make sure that sufficient information is passed on to the end user of the property. So obviously all certificates relating to the work, details of the installation has to be passed on. Where we have things like earth bonding um, and, and the like and the consumer unit, it has to be clearly labelled. Um, the circuits on the consumer unit should be clearly labelled so that it's absolutely clear uh, which fuses or micro switches control which circuit and if it's a particularly complicated installation 
plans of how it's been installed would be advantageous although in the domestic sector this is somewhat rare to be perfectly honest because design as i say tends to be something done in the head rather than on paper and if there are any operating instructions or logbooks again those would have to be left with the end user of the property so when it comes to, to certification and testing we can have a self-certification by a competent registered installer um, completing a certificate, notifying building control within 30 days, and then a compliance certificate for building regulations is issued to the homeowner by the building control body. Um, if it's part of an application, otherwise, if it's just done under a competent person scheme, then if it's a standalone item, that's as far as it will go. So the time scales vary because if we've got a third party certification, the person who's done the work contacts that third party within five days they come out and then test the installation and at that point a notification is given to building control within 30 days and then finally obviously if building control are doing the, uh, dealing with the project director there is no competent person they will be carrying inspections detailing the inspection regime and issuing a final certificate at the end of the job however it is worth noting that if that is the option that's taken, most building control bodies will be charging a significantly higher fee because of the additional work involved within the project. And then just one final um, word of warning in terms of Part P. We've talked about notifiable work being new circuits, consumer units, work in special locations, um, and the rest of the work is generally not notifiable however there is still a requirement for it to be installed safely in accordance with the british standard and if it becomes obvious to a building control body and in this instance it would be a local authority dealing with enforcement that there is an issue with the installation that it is unsafe or likely to cause a fire uh, they can still take enforcement action uh, to enforce the requirements of building regulations in terms of the safety of the system even though there's not been an, a requirement for notification of the works to be given to builder control so part p in itself is generally uh, an area of the building regulations that is dealt with by a level of cert self-certification um, by looking at competent design and installation and relying quite heavily on testing to demonstrate that uh, the work complies and it would be fairly true to say that since its introduction part p has improved standards within the electrical sector so let's think about moving on now to part q of the building regulations uh, one of the newest sections of the building regulations which in effect comes in in october so just a few weeks now and deals with security but again as with part p we are only looking at security in relation to domestic dwellings um, so we're looking at preventing unauthorized access and that means that we're trying to stop people getting into a dwelling now that could be a standalone house but it also means that if we've got a dwelling within a block of flats we would be looking to make sure that people can't get into the common areas of the block of flats and thereby get into the dwelling so we are looking at resisting unauthorized access to the building now what does this mean in practice well in reality what we're looking at when we talk about security as far as part q of the building regulations is concerned is we are looking at the doors and the windows their design um, and the ability to resist somebody entering through those in the past security has largely been addressed through the planning process and by requirements linked to secured by design initiatives and it's true to say that probably the large percentage of new dwellings built within the UK in recent years have had quite a good level of security uh, because a lot of warranty providers are looking for this as part of issuing the warranty on the pack property so we're making sure that easily accessible doors and windows um, resist somebody actually gaining access to the property and as I said that would include access to the common areas of block of flats where we're then going to get access to the flat it also includes us looking at things like integral garages 
and if we're not protecting the actual garage door itself we need to protect the door between the house and the garage so what does it mean in practice well again Park Q is very much relying upon the testing of doors and windows the requirement that we're looking for is that the door and the window can resist physical attack by a casual or an opportunist burglar now in reality this means that they have to be sufficiently robust and fitted with appropriate hardware to resist attack um, you may say well why are we dealing with terms like casual or opportunist burglar and that's because primarily in the testing regimes to which doors and windows are put um, there are categories of attack and what we're looking at in terms of attack is the, the more limited end um, if we've got somebody turning up who's um, a professional burglar and goes equipped with an awful lot of uh, mechanical equipment to gain entry then to be perfectly honest whatever we do we're not necessarily going to be resist that person getting into the property so we've drawn a line at a level of casual or opportunist burglar what that means in reality is that these people are considered to be those who are going to gain entry without making undue noise that may cause detection without unnecessary risk so we're not going to be, see people scaling the walls and, and shinning up drain pipes and gaining entry with only common hand tools and just normal physical force now common hand tools would include something like a, a crowbar but it's not necessarily going to include high level power tools or ram raiding or anything of that sort there is an issue that if we choose in terms of the the, the garage to protect the door between the house and the garage rather than the garage up and over door which obviously is, is the easier situation um, in the vast majority of properties once somebody's gained access to your garage and then close the garage door behind them they are fairly free from detection um, there is very limited risk and they also have access to any of your tools that you've left in the garage to enable them to gain access to your property so we're looking to try and make sure that we resist this um, everyday sort of attack it does unfortunately mean that if we design a new property to meet the requirements of Park Q and somebody gets burgled a fortnight later it may well just be that they didn't have a casual or opportunist burglar and it were most professional people involved um, so unfortunately when they come back to the designer and say you designed me a building that was supposed to meet Park Q and I got burgled what happened the the stock answer will unfortunately be well unfortunately you had a professional burglar and we can't design against that when it looks at um, doors windows we are very much looking at a testing regime um, we're looking at the door sets the door the frame the hardware and everything else um, designed to a standard to resist an attack the approved document does give us a bespoke option for timber doors which enables us to look at some one-off situations and a fairly bolt and braces robust door that to be honest were it to be tested would probably pass the standard but because we're looking at a one-off bespoke solution it wouldn't be economic to ask to test in those situations so we have a bespoke solution for doors we don't have a similar bespoke solution for windows the normal common features that we're going to see for a door um, will include something like the spy hole viewer it will include a door chain or a door limiter um, the only times you might not want to do that or may not do that is if it's in sheltered housing or wood controlled where the warden may need to gain access in an emergency or perhaps where we've got something like a CCTV system or a glazed panel next to the door where maybe actually the viewer isn't that um, important in those instances but those will be the common features we'll expect to see we also have to take a fairly common sense approach it's all well and good having a very robust door and frame um, but if we don't fix it correctly into the surrounding structure or the surrounding structure is particularly lightweight then actually it's going to be much easier just to pop the whole door and frame out than it is to actually force access through the door so the first installation requirement is that the door and the frame should be fixed as the manufacturer's instructions and that's simply because when any door or frame door set is tested 
it will be tested as installed to the manufacturer's instructions and those instructions will have been developed to make sure that the door performs in the correct way. If we're putting the door into a lightweight framed wall, we need to make sure that we include a resilient layer to stop anybody breaking through the wall and accessing the locking system or the fixing of the frame. And that could mean that we need a resilient layer to run the full height of the door, 600 millimetres either side, so that we can't actually break through. When we come to um, windows, although for doors we have two or three different standards we could test the door to, windows simply refer to compliance with PAS 24 2012. Now, PAS stands for publicly available specification. These are documents provided or developed by British Standards Institute and PAS 24 deals with testing regimes. So it details how the door, its hardware, the window, its hardware will be tested um, to ensure that it resists attack. Now, as far as the approved document is concerned, the only options for windows are to be tested to PAS 24. This may lead to some situations because um, the terminology right at the beginning of Part Q is somewhat different than we've seen in previous approved documents. Part Q says in terms of its um, scope that it applies to all new dwellings. Now in older approved documents when we talk about the similar thing we talk about where a dwelling is erected and where a dwelling is formed by a material change of use. The terminology in Part Q actually encompasses both of those. So Part Q does apply to a change of use and as such there is potentially the option that if you're dealing with a listed building or something in a conservation area, there will be issues in terms of what windows can be used. And that will be something to be resolved between the designer, building control and the conservation officer. And the, the view from DCLG is, as with all of the building, building regulations, it's up to the building control body to determine what actually equates to compliance. So when we're looking at windows, um, what we're looking at is windows that can easily be accessed from a level. Now that could be at ground or basement level if we can actually gain access outside. Anything within two meters of the ground. And if we've got a, a, a gently sloping roof, something at less than 30 degrees, within three and a half meters of ground level, then again there is the potential that somebody will hop up onto that roof and then gain access to a higher window and generally these tend to be the ones traditionally that have been more vulnerable because people are very, fairly vigilant about ground floor windows but not so much about first floor windows. So that's the basic concept in terms of windows, they really have to meet a standard. Now I did mention earlier on that in terms of doors we have a bespoke solution, something that can be designed that we can then say if we followed this, it doesn't necessarily have to be a test. It will be something that we will consider meets the requirement. There is no similar bespoke solution for a window. But again, I suppose you could use a common sense approach to say, has it got a lot of these particular features that we would expect to see? Now, the first thing with our bespoke timber door is it has to be a fairly hefty door. It's got to have a density of 600 kilograms per cubic meter. So it's a fairly chunky timber door. The rails, the styles, etc. have to start off life at least 44 millimeters thick and even when we reduce them to for panels we still end up, have to end up with a good thickness of timber. Panels themselves have to be 15 millimeters thick, they have to be fixed with beading that's mechanically fixed and glued. And the panel itself, the, sm the smaller dimension should be no more than um, 230 millimeters and this resists the, the ability to be able to knock in the panel if you like. Hinges can't be accessible from the outside and most importantly we need a multi-point locking system. Now the, the guidance for bespoke doors does actually then include a, a situation where if that's not feasible for some reason um, or the client can't provide that it does give provision for the more traditional Yale and deadbolt, uh, deadlock type system but multi-point locking systems are the preferred option and then we have to make sure that 
somebody from outside can't easily access something that might be in the property through the letterbox. So whether, you know, we're looking at um, whether people can actually get their hands through a letterbox to reach keys off the hall table, use a long stick to, to hook something up or what have you. So we restrict the size of the letterbox and we ask for a flap on the inside of it. Now this applies obviously to doors that are vulnerable, um, which wouldn't necessarily just be the front door, it could be the back door. And maybe one thing that's missing from the whole of this picture, particularly when we start looking at the size of letterboxes, is what do we do about the size of cat flaps? And what do we do about, indeed, what's increasingly being fitted in properties, dog flaps? Um, and again, really, what we'd have to say is these features are fine, but they need some plate or locking mechanism on the inside, which to a certain extent negates the idea of a cat flap in the first place. Right, so that's the detail of what's contained within Part Q. And similarly to Part P, a lot of this will revolve around certification and the right bit of paper being in place to demonstrate that the elements comply at the end of the job. So now we're going to pause and take some of those questions that you've been asking during the, the course of the webinar. <laughs> 